Dr. David Emmanuel Godley. He's Associate Dean for Academic and Vocational Formation and the Ruth W. and A. Morris Williams, Jr. Research Professor of Theology and Christian Ministry. He's also the Director of the Office of Black Church Studies at Duke Divinity School. He is a constructive theologian whose scholarship and practice are at the intersection of missiology, black theology, and leadership strategy. A globally recognized miss missiologist, he emphasizes cross-cultural experiential learning with indigenous communities to deepen understanding, broaden horizons, <coughs> and strengthen Christian discipleship and leadership formation. I also want to say that we are recognizing today the 50th anniversary, as a sign of hope, the 50th anniversary of the Office for Black Church Studies at Duke Divinity School. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. David Roth. We're just going to transition a moment so that we can you don't see us doing our work in public. Well, good, uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for your kind introduction, and thanks to Valerie for helping make sure I don't break our equipment. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here today, and we rejoice uh, in the Summer Institute and for the um, important and transforming work of the Center for Reconciliation. I'm grateful for our dean, uh, Dean Kanone Marik, and... Um, in 2018, um, he assumed the directorship of the center, and I also assumed the directorship of the Office of Black Church Studies. Uh, and one of our uh, tasks at that point was to explore and imagine ways where both of these entities uh, could uh, create some collaboration and find some synergy. And uh, it's been a, a joy uh, for me to be a companion with the Dean and to learn um, with and from him and for us to imagine some ways of working together. So I'm grateful for that, grateful uh, for the invitation uh, and for my colleagues who lead the, the center. So my assignment um, for these few minutes is to uh, talk about um, hope and liberation, and so the way that we're framing it is uh, a journey of hope toward liberation. So that's kind of the, the frame that we're going to try to use. Now, what we're also going to do, though, is start uh, with uh, some music. Let me see if I can swap screens here how I can do it. So we already know who we are, where we are. So I want you to see these words. This is a, a gospel song of an earlier iteration that I'm going to uh, uh, play. And, and it, uh, it, they do the same chorus a few times. Uh, the words are, I'm free, 
Praise the Lord, I'm free, no longer bound, no more chains holding me. My soul is resting, it's just a blessing. Praise <coughs> the Lord, hallelujah, I'm free. This is a, a, a song of, of worship and testimony uh, out of black church life. And we live in, those of us who are black and in the United States, and it's not only us, I'm just talking uh, illustratively. So it's an illustration that many people from different places in the country, in the world, wherever they're situated, uh, can connect at different points. But we live in, in a certain tension and tandem uh, of being free and not being free. Uh, of living with faith and living with frustration. And it's a both and. Uh, Dr. Nina talked about methodology. And when I, I finish today, I'm going to be finishing uh, with some of the work of J. D. Otis Roberts, uh, who is one of the architects of the Black Theology Project, whose methodology is both and. Uh, it's liberation and reconciliation. And we live in, in tension and in tandem. It's not in sequence. Uh, it's a both and way of thinking. So, for example, Roberts was born in 1927. Uh, he's yet alive. Um, but in his work as a philosophical theologian, he refused to romanticize the African part of his American experience. And he refused to demonize the European part of his American experience. Although there are things to celebrate and to criticize. Some people move one way and they move the other. They live at the polar extremes. And most people who live at the extremes are living in the wrong places. <laughs> and most of us live somewhere not in the extreme. And, and we have to learn, uh, we don't have to, it's constructive to learn to live in tension and in tandem. And so when he talks about liberation and reconciliation, that we have to pursue them both. It's like walking. You lead with liberation, but reconciliation has to come alongside. And it's never neat and it's never clean, but it's the, it's the price of the cross for Christians. And so this journey of it is a journey of hope, and it's going toward liberation, but it's an uneven journey. And so I want to start with some music. And so you're going to hear it. I've got the words up here because it's an easy song. This will be about three minutes of it we're going to listen to. And um, some people know it in here, uh, and some don't. And I'm going to try to swap, see if we can make this thing work and not blow up on me. <laughs> I have a certain level of technical expertise in the We need a woman to stand up. 
tell you, it's not gospel music. We don't rush. <laughs> because you need to hear it, you need to feel it. We sing in harmony. And so, uh, I try to bring the words back up when I need to still go over. singing with it, but okay. some of us will sing it. All right, all right, all right. I was waiting on y'all to kind of start, but I didn't want to put any pressure on you. But that's a that's a kind of that's a kind of testimony of of being free, even while not being free. It's that tension and that tandem. Um. Some, some of you, when you were studying and, and talking about your realized and unrealized eschatology, um, but, but we're free and not free, but we live on a journey of hope because we're moving in that direction. Uh, and that is a part of what uh, we are talking about today. So uh, this was my assignment. So I'm, I'm, this was my assignment. I'm doing what I've told. <laughs> I get along better that way. So, this is a question of process. So the question is, what does liberation look like? Um, and, and which highlights models, stories, experiments that shape and sustain a new future in our context. We understand liberation and reconciliation to be concurrent processes. And so this is what I'd like, uh, um, I'd like for us to, to share a bit as we may be inspired on this. Where can we see signs pointing toward liberation? The question invites the participant into a vision, imagination, and capacity for hope leading toward 
liberation and reconciliation. Now, what, uh, any preachers in here? Anybody in here who preach from time to time? From time to time. Okay. So, if you're preaching, uh, and and you you want you want to start getting people, you know, kind of lean in your direction, whether they are verbal or physical. All you have to do is start going negative. <laughs> start talking about how bad things are, how bad people are. You know, what's wrong with the church? What's wrong with women? What's wrong with men? What's wrong with the old? What's wrong with the young? What's wrong with and yeah, say it, Reverend. You're right. Preach. And it's easy. Yeah, preach. I mean, it's like every round goes lower and lower. And there's a temptation that we have to do that. Turn on your social media. Turn on the news. People look for dimness. Uh, I used to lead a global mission society, and every summer I'd have between five and six hundred adolescents on a college campus for mission mobilization and mission education. I could not pay for news media. Six hundred, uh, sixteen to twenty-one year olds, who were doing service projects, who were worshiping, who were studying who are building advocacy campaigns, who are learning how do I take these gifts and then take them back home. I could not pay for a news camera. If I had six on a street corner breaking out a window, it would have been all the news, all the cameras, talking about how bad adolescents are. Mm -hmm. And it's that way in churches too. Find five people unhappy. <laughs> 95 are happy. And you get all wrapped up and you let five people hijack your ministry. Say that. Because every round goes lower and lower. But we follow Jesus who has overcome the world. So that does not mean that we live with necessarily rose-tinted glasses and everything and Hallelujah all the time. But we, we have confidence in what God has done and what God is doing. And so what I'd like to ask you then, based on the question I was given, <laughs> uh, what, uh, where can we see signs pointing toward liberation? So some, this is not rhetorical. <laughs> this is participatory. Are there any signs? Or where where are there signs? This is this is your turn. This is your turn. Where are signs? You don't have to give a, a long exposition. Are there any signs anywhere? Yes, sir. We are here as are one church. Okay. Amen. One church. Anybody else? Where are signs? What does the journey look like? Where are signs? I do think we see it in young people. Like you said, you, you are able to mobilize young people towards mission. And I think the news has a problem with covering that side of justice. It's hard to, it's hard to monetize positive news. <laughs> it's easy to monetize misery. Any, anywhere else? Are there? Where do you? Or do or if you don't see signs, where should we see signs? Mm -hmm. uh, in small improvements along the way, uh, slavery in its original form is no longer legal. Women have the right to vote, etc. There's small improvements, still ways to go, but bits of liberation at a time. Okay. Bits of liberation at a time. So the needle is moving in some places. Anybody else? It's going back to the enemy. Yeah, Say that again? Yeah, it's in the but like we have, or we're doing some things. Okay. We go forward and we go back. Hopefully we get a net gain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I 
and we need to say as a sign of liberation and, and thank you, Lord. That someone like our dear sister Lenore was here and spoke words of tremendous courage. No one stood up on that. Okay. <laughs> but you know, another thing is we have to be careful when we draw conclusions because we have a certain kind of limitation on where we are in the journey. Uh, it's kind of like if you if you're at if you're at a movie and you leave if you're at a theater, you all look like y'all well cultured. <clears throat> it's like a theater, not a theater. <laughs> And, and, and you, you're, you're sitting and you're watching the play and then there's an intermission and then they draw the curtains and the lights come up. Well, if you don't know that that's a break, you leave and you've drawn some conclusions about the performance because you left too soon. And we sometimes draw conclusions too soon because we think that we can, we can manage the arc. But it's an uneven journey. And I want to uh, propose to you that God is doing some things all the time that you don't know what God is up to. And... We can see glimpses, but our, our conclusions have to be tentative conclusions. And even when it looks like it's going back now, where we are, we don't see everything. And we don't see the long arc. And all of us in here are old enough to know sometimes you go back and get yourself together, and then you go forward. Sometimes you retreat. And then you make progress. But we have to be careful not to draw premature conclusions. It might look like this now, but we trust that God is up to something. And we have to be careful. So the, the journey toward liberation is uneven. It can be mountainous. It can be treacherous. But it's a journey. And so... Hit the wrong button. And so I want to talk then about uh, three things. I'm a, I'm a Baptist preacher. So three things. But also brain science says that you can remember in three. So it's not just. If it's not just a, you know, a preacher trick, you remember the threes. Read your brain science. I want to talk about three things about a journey of hope. One is one marker on the journey of hope. And before I do this, let me say that um, Gardner Calvin Taylor was one of the legendary preachers of the 20th century. And uh, Taylor's ministry spanned some 60 years. He spent almost 40 of it at the Concord Baptist Church of Christ in Brooklyn, New York, in a time where New York was like an epicenter of vibrant churches and prominent preachers. It's not quite that now in terms of the church, but it was a time. And one of the things that uh, Gardner Calvin Taylor, he did not preach with notes or a manuscript. And when teaching preaching and teaching preachers, among the things that he did was he encouraged preachers around prayer and preparation around immersing yourself in the arts and reading good literature. He was particularly a fan of mystery novels. Mm -hmm. he, said, he said people who write good mysteries know how to move a story. And the preachers have to learn how to move a story. He, he talked about engaging in people's lives because people come to hear from the Lord. So we need to be involved in people's lives so that we can hear the questions that people are asking and grapple with the text. He talked about reading the great preachers. He was particularly inspired by the kind of Scottish tradition 
particularly Alexander McLaren. But one of, one of his memorable strategies about preaching is he said, when you're preaching, think of preaching like a journey. And you know where the journey is and identify some signposts. So then you don't have to be, um, it's not a rigid route, but it's a journey. And as long as you know the signposts, you know you keep moving towards your destination. But while you're moving there, you might see some flowers along the way and you might stop and pay attention to them. Or you might see, you know, an interesting development along the way. And it's all right while you're on the journey to stop and enjoy that, but you know you're going to the next signpost. And so while we're talking about journey, I want to talk about some of these signposts. And one of them is that hope emanates. It comes from the liberating God. It's not because of us. It comes from God. And the text is full of, of examples of God's liberty. I just want to point to one in Exodus. You remember when Moses is encountered by God? Uh, when I grew up, they used to say on the back side of a mountain. I don't know what the front side of a mountain is, but they say on the back side of a mountain. And, and that, that, you know, he was caring for Jethro's sheep. And he looks over, he sees a bush that is on fire, but the bush will not be consumed. And, and so he goes and investigates the bush, and the Lord speaks to him and says, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. You remember that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, y'all church people, y'all know that. Okay. I don't have to unpack that. So, but, but in, in, in the encounter, here is what Moses is told. The Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and spacious land. The cry of the Israelites has come to me. I have seen how the Egyptians oppress them. Now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And so the hope, our hope is not something we cook up. And hope is not a rhetorical trick so that you use your words smooth and, and in, in, in interesting ways so, so you can whip up emotion. <clears throat> I once upon a time was a church musician. And I know how you can use instrumentation uh, to conjure a spirit. It may or may not be holy. But just like you can use music, you can use words. You know, you preachers, y'all do it sometimes. You know, when y'all about to flunk, then you go and find something that you know. Pastor Justin, he's, he's shaking his head and saying, don't say that out loud. Don't Never say that. Never have to do it. Never have to do it. All right, you know, he's the one. There is one. I heard about that. Uh, you get in trouble and then you go take a, a turn so that you know, you know, you, you know, some people know what to say uh, to, to kind of get people back with you when you're in trouble. But the, you don't just cook it up. Or the theatrics, or the drama. Hope springs from God who sees, who hears, who knows, and who comes. And that is a necessary reminder for people when the weight is heavy. That God sees, hears our cries, knows our condition, and comes to see about us. And parenthetically, comes through somebody. And that somebody just might be you. So that's one marker on the journey, I think along the way, is to remember that hope springs from God who hears, sees, discerns, 
and comforts. Another marker on the journey of hope toward liberation is that hope is confidence in what God can do. God may or may not do what we want God to do. But hope is confidence. I, I, I'm betting my life on it. That's confidence. You bet your life on it. In what God can do. Not what I can do. Not what you can do. Not what the political situation can do. Not what the economic theorists do. Not what the philosophers do. Not what the theologians do. Not what the divinity schools do. But in what God can do. You remember this story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? See, it's good. I'm talking to people who y'all know the book, right? <laughs> my joke with my uh, pastor of blessed memory was John Peterson. Uh, is that I'm a theologian. I read about the Bible, so I like to be around pastors who read it. <laughs> <laughs> and preferably believe it. <laughs> That's, I look, I look, I look for those. I look for those. Um, and and so Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, Abednego. So they refused to bow to the king. And you know, king gets an attitude. Is it true that you're not going to bow? And they end up responding. They answer the king. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. We have no need to do that. And the reason is, if our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire out of your head, let him deliver. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your God. And we will not worship the golden statue that you have. Now that's confidence. Mm -hmm. If God, if God can do it, let God do it. We know what God can do, but God is not obligated to do what I want God to do. Now that's you growing up when you get there. You know, you you growing up when you say God can do it. But if God chooses, because I don't know what all God's got going on. I don't know the whole plan. I can see, you know, if I, I can, now, I can, I know that there's some people there. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you look like. I tell you, that's kind of a burgundy. Something that's gold. <laughs> that's dark. I don't know if it's black, blue, gray. And further, we all back. I don't know what y'all got going on. But our, our, lim our vision is limited. And But when you have confidence in God, that, that keeps you hopeful. Because I know what God can do. And when God gets ready, God will do what God chooses to do. God can do whatever. Uh, uh, there's a gospel song in another generation said, God can do whatever God wants to, when God wants to, the way God wants to, God's God is sovereign. I struggle this sometimes. We, we get mad when God doesn't do what we want God to do. Go on and get mad. <laughs> but come to yourself. Because God is doing, there is, there, is, there is a reality, but there are also what I like to think of as supra-reality. There's some things going on and we get it. But God is also doing something else that we don't get, we don't see, we don't even know God is moving. But God is at work. <clears throat> Working things out because God is going to complete what God began. We're somewhere on the journey. And it's not all going to be done on my time or on your time. And so one, one stop on the journey. Remember I was talking about on, on the preaching journey, you got some signposts. 
So one signpost is hope emanates from God, who God is. Another is hope is confidence in what God can do should God choose to. And then another stop along this journey is hope is inspired by what God has done. You know somebody, you know you can trust somebody when they've proven themselves to be trustworthy. Um, and so, uh, you remember, we, you know, we're still in the Sundays of Easter. Some of us. Some of us, Easter's done. But others, we still have <laughs> in the Sundays of Easter. And you remember in Matthew, after the Sabbath, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. That must have been a peculiar walk that day. After all they had seen and done. So you know, you know the story, so I don't have to I don't have to preach it to you. I enjoy preaching this story, but I won't do it. I won't bother you. <laughs> but they get to where Jesus had been buried. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. For he's been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. I had somebody once ask me in the, in the intensity, you know, a few years ago when there was a heightened awareness of, of racism because of some very public demonstrations and displays of the murder of black people. And somebody asked me, are, are, you, are you hopeful about racism? About ever getting past racism? I said, yeah. I said, God raised Jesus from the dead. He can deal with y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you're not death in the grave. You're not sin in the grave. Yeah. Since God, not yet, since God. Now, I believe in the resurrection. Yeah. If you don't believe in the resurrection, I don't know what you got to be hopeful in. <laughs> you know, that's in y'all's text. If in this world, this is it, this is all we got. If this is all we've got, pretty miserable. So I don't know what you, I don't know what your hope is. But if, since Jesus was raised, by God from the dead. Yeah. I have hope. I don't know when I'll see it. And I may not see it all. But I'm a part of the journey. And somebody else is going to join the journey when I peel off. But there will always be people on this sacred journey. Sometimes it'll be more, sometimes it'll be a few. But there's going to be people on the journey, and right now we're on the journey, hopefully. And so on these markers, on, these, on this journey, it is hopeful. Not because of what we cooked up, cooked up, but because hope emanates from God. Because hope is grounded his confidence in what God is able to do. God's ability. God can do what God wants to do when God gets ready. And I've got evidence that God has done some pretty amazing things. The most of which is to raise Jesus from the dead. And he won't die again. Huh? I feel like since God did that, God can handle y'all's foolishness. <laughs> Whoever you are in God's time. Finally, I want to say a word about reconciliation and uh, liberation and reconciliation. And I mentioned uh, the thought, and I want to uh, encourage you, if you don't know his work, to take a look at the work of J. D. Otis Roberts. His seminal work in 1971 was Liberation and Reconciliation of Black Theology. 
uh, people are more familiar with the language and the, uh, they're more familiar with the name of James Cone. I don't know if they know his work. I don't know if people read it. Because sometimes I hear people say what they say Cone said, and I'm not sure. I've read Cone. <laughs> um, some of y'all who, who were around when um, uh, Lloyd Benson was debating Dan Quayle <laughs> uh, for vice presidency, and Dan Quayle said something about like John Kennedy. Lloyd Benson said, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> I knew John Kennedy. John Kennedy was my friend. And you, Senator, are no John Kennedy. <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> One of the things that Robert says, and I share with you his methodology about liberation and reconciliation, you live in tandem because you have to live in both and. And it's dialogical. It's going back and forth. And so one of the things that Robert says is that liberation, the church is called to, to make an assault on supremacy and power. Now, of course, he was right. That, that work was in the 70s. He was dealing with a black-white binary in the United States. And so he was talking about an assault on white supremacy and white power and its domination. The uh, inherent assumption in the supremacy of some because of their racial ethnic identity and the inherent inferiority, inferiority of everybody else. There was a binary, but the principle is that the church is called to make an assault on supremacy and power anywhere where there are people who assume the inherent superiority of some as a group and the inherent inferiority of others as a group we need to wage war on that and not allow it to stand and challenge it and that's one of the, the calls that Roberts says that we need to make but he also says that people cannot be reconciled to each other unless they are reconciled to God. And so I think our call is how do we get people reconciled to God? Because you cannot be reconciled with somebody who assumes that you are inherently inferior. How are you going to do that? They don't even think you're worthy to sit at the same table. And so our, our work is around. So if anyone is in Christ, the text says, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Look, new things have come into being. All this is from God who reconciled us to God's self through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to God's self, not counting their trespass against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. And that is not Rodney King saying, can't we all get along? No, we all can't get along. If you think I am inherently inferior, if you think it's acceptable to, to rob me of opportunities just to live, you're going to starve me to death. Poverty is a, pre, is a sentence to premature death. If you're going to keep me in poverty, if you're going to over-police me and over-prosecute me and over-penalize me, if you're going to keep me from health and education and opportunities for flourishing. If you, if you think I'm not even worthy of that, we cannot be reconciled. But my call is to be an ambassador of reconciliation to try to get you reconciled to God. And if we come closer to God, we'll come closer to each other. And that's hard work. That is hard work, but it's not your work. It's God's work that God has called you to do. It's God's work, and we are God's workers. 
for God's field. And that hopefully takes the pressure off you. It's not your responsibility to produce the outcome. It's your responsibility to bear witness to the risen Christ in hope toward liberation. It's not your job to fix somebody. It's your job to bear witness and our job to bear witness. Some plant, some water, God gives the growth. So why hope for liberation? Since God freed Israel from Egyptian bondage and since God raised Jesus from the grave, bringing victory over sin and death, then, therefore, God can bring justice out of injustice. And may we all keep on this sacred journey of hope toward liberation. Amen. Amen. Amen.